Good morning from London. On behalf of the Goethe Institute London and everyone involved, I'm very excited to welcome you all from around the world to the DAO sessions at World Prototypes. This is the first of six online events to discover a new set of experimental projects to reinvent the future of the art world with blockchain by investigating what can be learned from DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, working with others. Each event introduces one of five new progressive blockchain art prototypes created by DAO teams in Berlin, Hong Kong, Johannesburg, and Minsk, as part of a large international collaboration of the last 18 months. Each session aims to address a key question about the potential of blockchain systems to decentralize power structures and to rewire the arts. I briefly want to use this moment to thank everyone involved who has been working tirelessly in the different cities during this exciting endeavor. In order to include the widest audience possible, we are pleased to welcome Ali, who will be translating today's event into British Sign Language, and we will be using visual descriptions, which means any presenter will describe themselves and any images they use. So I'm Katrine and I have dark hair and I'm wearing a black dress and scarf today. Ali, would you briefly like to describe yourself? Hello, I'm Ali. Um, I'm a black woman uh, with brown hair, uh, glasses, and I'm wearing a green jumper. Thank you, Ali. Please do, not, uh, please do post any questions you have in the Q&A section and our host will ensure that they get heard and discussed by our presenters. If you do not want to use or say your name in the relation to a question you pose in the Q&A section, please do state so when asking the question. I will now hand over to Ruth, Artistic Director of Furtherfield, and Penny Rafferty, writer and researcher, who are the curators and hosts of the DAO sessions at World Prototypes. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Uh, we're really excited to be here today. Uh, and for this first session, uh, we have um, Laura Lotti, uh, Callum Bowden from Trust. And we're very excited about the work they've been doing on the Black Swan DAO prototype. Uh, Laura Lotti is a researcher investigating the transformations of monetary technologies in relation to economic and cultural formation. And Callum Bowden creates stories, worlds, and platforms. He's also the co-founder of Trust. So Trust is an incubator for utopian conspiracy in Berlin. Um, so Trust describes itself more formally at the moment as an interdisciplinary research and development lab in Berlin for artists, designers, technologists, and ecologists working with advanced technologies and experimental theories. Uh, Trust nurtures new forms of creative practice, assembling and accelerating collective interests, objectives, standards, and sympathies. And as with all the sessions, the host partners uh, play a really important role in the way in which uh, teams are being supported and the work that happens. So we're really uh, appreciative of the work of uh, Laura Callum and the wider trust community. Um, I should describe myself. Um, I'm a white woman with uh, brown mid-length hair. I've got pandemic hair, uh, glass, like uh, brown glasses and a bright pink turtleneck top on. Um, so, I'm just going to start with a really short explainer. We're really, one of the things that we want to do with this project is to bring more people into this area that we think is really important. So uh, we're going to start with it, just to start with a really short explainer about what DAOs are and why we think, what they bring to the art world. Then we'll have a presentation from uh, the Black Swan DAO guys. Uh, interspersed with questions from you and us. So DAOs are automated organizations. So this is a new way of working translocally. So we can make automated organizations that work locally, but that can be templated to work in other places, templated and then rewritten to work in other localities. Um, so this kind of this translocal way of working 
benefits from the trust and verification systems, blockchain based funding, member anonymity, transparent governance, and these, these partnerships across distance and difference. In the past, artists have used manifestos to organize and mobilize. And I think it's useful to think of art world DAOs as executable manifestos. So these are created to organize and record member interactions by, and then by marshalling kind of their resources and actions into the future, they can provide a powerful vehicle for works of collective imagination. Uh, now I'm going to hand you over to Penny. Hello, good morning. Um, I'm Penny. I'm a white woman. I have um, green eyes and freckles, and I'm wearing a great t shirt that my friend Sibel made, uh, which is like red, white -ish sort of dots, and it says, Feed the rich to the dragons which I think is uh, very apt for my mood this morning. Um, following on a little bit from Ruth, I would like to say that the aims of these presentations is to share and exchange knowledge about the genesis process and results of 2020 Art World DAO prototype developments that we've been working on and with the teams that will present. We think these projects offer us opportunities for thinking radically differently about 2021 and the rest of the decade, especially about translocality, how blockchains enable new forms of cooperation in and across localities, and in a way how different localities can bring new values, alternative modes of governance and imaginative communities which will hopefully shape this powerful global technology that is mostly used for finance and organizing, but has the potential to do much, much more. How collaborative artistic practices and networks can bring the necessary breadth to diversify human creation and open up methods of living differently. And lastly, in the words of my collaborator, conspiracist and kin, this project is really about radical friendships. And the world we live in, it's been crafted on a daily basis, whittled down futures are occurring every second. And so we believe it's of the utmost importance for the art world to be part of this conversation, which is in essence, the drive of creating the art world prototype series and binding it to the blockchain before DAO technologies have become solidified. Thanks, Penny. Uh, so now we will hand over to the Black Swan DAO team. Um, just so you audience members know what's going to happen, um, we're going to split this presentation into two parts. First, the research, which will be a shorter part. So there'll be a short presentation and Penny and I will uh, follow up with uh, questions and we'll have a conversation, hopefully drawing on the questions that you feed us also. Um, and then the second part will be longer, which is about the experiment, like what actually happened when this research got applied at Trust. And this will be a longer session, we hope 25, 30 minutes. Again, the sh a short presentation with conversation where we get to understand really what happened. So now I'd like to hand over to Laura and Callum, could you please start just by describing yourselves? Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Laura. I'm a white woman with long uh, curly uh, brown hair and I'm wearing a black uh, turtleneck. And I'm Callum, I'm a white man with brown hair, green eyes and a beard. I will now try to share my screen in the most graceful way possible. Thank you for the intros, Ruth and Penny. And uh, following in the spirit of radical friendship, I'm sitting here with my friend Laura and Callum. And I'm Laura. 
And today we're going to talk about our project Black Swan. Black Swan is a digital tool that allows groups of artists to decide how to use resources. Our presentation is structured into two parts. The first part will go over the research that we did. And the second part will look at the experiments that we um, conducted collaboratively with a group of nine um, creative practitioners at Trust. So to begin, I'll talk about insights about the art context that Black Swan emerges from. Artists compete for fewer and fewer resources and opportunities. New art practices are not well served by existing support structures. Artists have always collaborated with others. Art institutions can share technologies and platforms. There's no need for different art institutions to each develop their own solutions to problems they share. And I'll talk a little bit about our analysis of blockchain and how we've been using it so far in the process. So, so blockchains are databases that store a full copy of the data on many computers that is in a decentralized manner. Blockchains use financial rewards uh, to allow for a network uh, to agree on the correct version of a database. As Ruth was mentioning, uh, blockchains make DAO possible. So these are digital organizations that are run by their members. A blockchain is a complex technology that requires expert knowledge to use. And the financial rewards uh, mean that uh, blockchains can be expensive to use uh, with uh, very different prices at different times. So for the moment, we use blockchain as a tool for the imagination. We've been uh, in our process uh, applied uh, thinking through blockchain without uh, applying the technology itself uh, on the basis of this. Uh, uh, trade-offs and pros and cons that we've uh, identified. From this context, both technological, social, and economic, we then ask the question, how can we enable groups of artists to work together and take control of resources and opportunities? We looked at the field um, to generate insights, looking at open source projects, cryptocurrency projects, NGOs, um, emerging ways of uh, communicating online, and we developed a series of insights that we used to um, inform the strategy that we took with Black Swan. This uh, research will later be published in a report where we publish all the findings related to the experiments that we did and the insights that we developed, but we'll give a quick um, overview now of the types of things that we, we learned. So, First, there's the what. So what are the things, what are the resources or forms of value that people in an organization have to share with each other or might want to distribute? Um, so we looked at skills, funding, collective power, um, networks, tools, advice and guidance, public and common goods and shared experiences. A group or an organization or a community needs to be located somewhere. Um, and we were interested in how digital technologies have changed where people are, um, are socializing. And so we were interested in virtual organizations, um, instant messaging platforms like Discord, which we'll talk about later, and um, cooperative projects. And then with regard to the who, the community building aspects, uh, we've been looking at uh, mechanisms for skills sharing and matching, um, mechanisms for sharing risk, uh, and then a network based on uh, solidarity and mutualism. Um, we've also looked at um, ways to uh, realize collective investments and pooling resources together. And then with regard to the how, the decision-making aspects, uh, we've been looking at uh, mechanisms to uh, begin expressing voting uh, uh, through emojis, uh, uh, through platforms such as Discord. Uh, we've been looking at lottery mechanisms, um, uh, the use of uh, automated bots uh, that can uh, automate uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, um, decisions. Uh, 
we've been looking at equal distribution of resources uh, and uh, a multi-voting system where um, uh, the, um, the, the prize is shared uh, among the participants. So now we move to questions on the research phase with the research section of our presentation. And yeah, definitely feel free to um, put any questions in the Q&A, anything that wasn't clear, anything you'd like us to talk more about. Um, and I know Ruth and Penny have lots of questions to interrogate us with. <laughs> we did joke as we were preparing for this session that if your research presentation was so clear, clear there would be no questions left. And I think you are challenging us a little bit because that, like, that's really bucking the trend of anything uh, that sits across art and blockchain being quite hard to get your head around. So thank you for that super clear intro. Um, I'll I'll kick off first. Um, I guess a question that we might not come to later. So I'm going to ask it now. Is I think that there's quite a lot of um, it's really hard to understand from the outside what the level of development is for actual technical DAOs at the moment. And some people are saying that the, these kind of, uh, that these tools aren't going to be mainstream for another five years. Can you tell us from your kind of research and experience what your sense is of where we are, where, how the, what, where the tech ecosystem is? at the moment. Can it... there's, um, there's a background noise at the moment. I'm not sure if that's audible to everybody. <laughs> can, I, can I also just maybe suggest that we go, oh, I don't know if is this, could you turn off your slide share? Because I just think while we chat, it might be nice if we could see our faces a bit bigger. Thank you. We can't hear your background noise, or I can't, anyway. Right. So, well, at the moment, the technology is uh, very much in a, a development phase. So it is not mature um, at all. As we were saying, there is also, um, there are issues with regard to the costs uh, that are implied in using it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's also, um, none of these mechanisms uh, has been tested in the wild for a um, you know for like a sustained period of time uh, therefore this is why also our idea um, or our approach uh, has been very incremental and so kind of taking the mechanisms uh, um, that blockchain kind of introduces for us to begin uh, thinking about how to organize uh, in a more horizontal or collaborative ways or uh, making decisions together but at the moment without uh, going through all the effort that it takes to build the full infrastructure without uh, even having tested the mechanisms first. So, yeah. And um, just to comment a bit on the level of the technology as it exists now, um, most blockchains use transactions to come to agree on the correct store of data in the database. And what this means when you're talking about an organization is it costs money to vote or it costs money to come to agree on anything. And the issue with blockchains like Ethereum is these um, cryptocurrencies have a market value that is fluctuating constantly. So maybe if you tried to vote in your DAO organization two weeks ago, it would have cost you $300, but today it would cost you $10. which also limits accessibility to this type of um, organizing. Thank you for that. Um, I also had a question, um, and I think that it also sets a little bit into another question that's sitting in the QA. Um, I would just like to go, for you to go briefly into the ways in which you've used voting, because for example, this use of emoji voting or the lotto voting system, I think that these kind of also bring up ideas about like the emotions and the socio-political resonance of voting, 
And I think that I would love to hear a little bit more about that. And the question that potentially um, it's got of osmosis between what I'm saying and Bibi is saying, they say, can you describe the difference between multi-voting and winner takes all? In which case is it used and how would you describe it in relation to the regular liberal democratic processes? Just a note on Penny's question, I think that the experiment section will cover in more detail this question. Um, but I think more um, generally uh, in relation to the difference between multi-voting and winner takes all, um, from what I understand, multi-voting allows for multiple preferences to be articulated by a a public or a community or group of people. Um, you, it's not a binary choice between two things, but you have the ability to express level of preference. And then um, multiple things can win or receive a different percentage of the total funding available or the resources available. Um, and then I, I mean, this idea of like the emoji and the emotion of participating in a political system, I think is really um, a, a crucial question to unpack and not something that we looked at so much in our research. Um, on Discord, where we used the emoji voting. It's something that I think came out in the, as we were doing a first debriefing after the voting and begin to test uh, um, um, how people were feeling about uh, private versus public conversations, for instance. Uh, I guess this, um, yeah, psychosocial aspect that perhaps relates uh, to making decisions together um, through a digital uh, interface. But, and I guess that we've been uh, focusing on Discord uh, being the platform that, as we'll see, like uh, Trust uh, already uses, uh, uh, where the Trust members already interact uh, and um, share um, uh, together. So, um, yeah, the idea of uh, using uh, mechanisms such as emojis uh, that is already used, uh, but to maybe express uh, um, preferences in a different way felt like quite interesting to explore. Yeah, I mean, this kind of ties into Ruth's question before is um, if many of the existing experiments in blockchain based organizing are technically quite complicated to use, our first ambition was to try and design a participatory system that fit into the way that people already communicate and already are organizing. And so this is why we wanted to base it in Discord and this is why we wanted to use emojis or test emojis as a way of voting um, because we wanted to not create voter fatigue where people are expected to put a lot of effort into voting. So guys, we've got now got some really great questions flowing in. Uh, I think what we might do is save some of these questions for after the next session, but I maybe we can come to just one from Ryan, which is this question of how um, they say all the aspects you mentioned are practically how a lot of collectives and co-ops kind of function. How does putting it through blockchain significantly change and how would this look like exactly or just a sense of it? So I guess that because I, I think we're going to get a sense of it when you talk about the experiments you've been doing, but just kind of like, what does it mean to put these kinds of practices onto the blockchain for you? Well, as we've discussed, uh, like blockchains or DAOs are um, automated organizations uh, in a way. So um, using these uh, protocols uh, enables to um, streamline perhaps uh, certain um, bureaucratic relations, if you will. But there is uh, some aspect of the, um, of the protocol uh, that um, even resonates perhaps with a ritual kind of like encounters and interactions. And so um, we see uh, DAOs as a way to maybe facilitate 
what artists have already been doing, but um, enable collaboration to occur at a distance, for instance, uh, in a way that, that would be easier than, uh, you know, with the current tools and means. So this is our ambition, and this is uh, uh, where we really would like to take place on. And so, think, yeah, go on. No, just to um, jump in on that really eloquent answer is like, I understand blockchains as automated rule enforcement machines and they, they lend themselves well to um, thinking about shared codes and codifying social relations, um, transaction protocols, voting mechanics, um, rules of entrance and exit. Okay, guys, so we're I'm really keen that we don't run out of time. Uh, so I propose that while you set up your screen share for the next part, I think it would be really good. Maybe if Penny and I just take it in turns to read out the questions that have come up so that we can kind of have these floating in our minds during your presentation. Um, so I, I might start with uh, Martin who describes himself as a white male with graying beard and wearing a red puffy down gilet. Uh, a conceptual question. The first few slides were about competition for resources and taking ownership of them. Is this a way of implicitly acknowledging that art communities have already been assimilated into property oriented systems, AKA capital? Um, Penny, would you like to? I will follow with Federico Banelli, mm -hmm. who is a bearded Mediterranean, but very kind man. Um, he asks, DAOs could be made as well out of the Ethereum ecosystem to avoid gas costs. And IMHO is mainly about organization and formation of organization. And then he's applied a link, um, commonfair.eu. Um, so I think maybe that's also something that I'm sure Laura and Callum can probably iterate, but maybe we just keep continuing and then maybe you can also answer the questions as you go through the research, if you can multitask in that way. <laughs> um, I, I, I would like to just read a couple more out because otherwise they're going to get lost. So uh, Anthony says Bitcoin presents a currency alternative to the dollar. Do you think blockchain presents an alternative to the value system of the current art system, or will it just be used by that art system? Um, John we, had a great one that I think will be answered in a second. Could you give me an example of how this might work? <laughs> thank you. Eve Ask maybe you can tell a bit more how communities can influence the inner protocols of blockchain platforms they're going to use. Uh, Francis, uh, you keep talking about the monetary cost of voting. Why can you not use the technology with a form of worthless token, or at least tokens that are just worth themselves rather than a pegging it to a real world currency? And can you not build a blockchain of your own? Proficient people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am new to this, so sorry if this is super naive, which I don't think it is. I think it's a very important question. Inter says, will we talk more about what we hope this will mean for the arts or any other application spaces? Penny mentioned futures coming into being all the time. What kind of future are we interested in? I know this is a really big question, uh, but Inter says she's interested in the connection between small technical ideas, like different ways of decision-making and the larger goals. Jean Clavin, hi again. Are we working together to create art content? It's quite an open question. Idil, uh, the question relates to decision making. How does the decision making process work and how do different opinions find platforms to be in the case of disagreement? Brian Weiss, is there a digital assets hedge fund involved anywhere here? And uh, the final one for this session uh, is new developments need to solve a problem. Um, could you clearly state what problem this solves? What kind of things would be voted on and each vote costs money and the costs would be paid in cryptocurrency? Question mark. Okay, so we'll come back to Martin's last question, but these things are 
we can't answer each thing individually we don't have time uh, but let's all hold these in our minds while we go into the next part and thank you for all the questions uh, yeah it's really also helpful to make us think more about our project um so this is the second part of our presentation where we'll talk about the black swan working group which um was hosted at trust over the month of january of this year it's very fresh um this is a, a slide with an image taken at trust of joanna who's a trust member and co-organizer sitting in front of a green screen Trust is a collective project for the research, development, and maintenance of shared infrastructures and imaginaries. We have an online community on Discord, which is a communication platform and forum um, that has about 300 members, and we have a shared workspace in Berlin. Trust, um, the members around Trust reflect emerging forms of creative practice. Um, the, it's a very interdisciplinary group with backgrounds in design, art, technology, strategy, ecology, and theory, um, who don't necessarily fit within existing art and design infrastructures. Um, so we really wanted to test Black Swan and Trust also as potentially a new type of infrastructure to support practices that, that don't, aren't really um, met by the existing art worlds. And we took a working group based approach, um, which means that we wanted this to be an open research process that involved others. Um, and the working group was made up of six, uh, nine people who were all members of trust, both um, in Berlin and beyond. And we met every week um, for four weeks and um, we'll explain the breakdown of the process. Um, we really wanted to test some of our assumptions around um, decision-making process and uh, propo proposal making. Uh, we wanted to look at the types of things that trust members want funding to do. Um, and so we kind of designed the process to be extremely open the group used the trust discord for communication and was facilitated by the swan bot, which was actually just me uh, pretending to be a bot. And in this slide, you see an, a screenshot of the black swan working group channel in the trust discord. Black swan offered a funding pot of 1000 euros um, to be distributed by the group and paid participants 250 euros each for their research. And the goal of the working group was really to test these governance mechanisms and to allocate the common funds towards collaborative projects. And here is a screenshot of our uh, kickoff meeting um, where I was explaining the timeline. And now um, I'm going to talk about how we broke down the process. Uh, the first part uh, of the working group in the first week, uh, we focused on the proposal making aspect. And so um, we wanted to test a very simple and open proposal format. Uh, you can see here a screenshot of the Google form that we use to create this uh, um, open proposal that we sent to um, all the participants. Um, and that could be hacked or used in different ways. So we didn't um, have any um, restriction or a compulsory fields. So people could ideally only um, have an image or a title or description. Uh, but um, these are the fields that we kind of uh, thought about in terms of like a, um, each proposal, the proposal form had a title, description, the kind of outputs. Uh, um, the budget, uh, who are the co-conspirators uh, or the uh, collaborators uh, um, within these projects, uh, then different tags and categories uh, and additional information. We also asked um, for each proposal to think about the type of license that they wanted attached right. to their work, whether they owned the rights and the copyright to the work or whether it could be open sourced or if it was licensed via Creative Commons so that others could use it for non-commercial uses. Um, and this was an interesting insight from the research that 
artists aren't always happy to open source all of their work, depending on what the project is. Um, and so we wanted to also see how people would uh, elect to license their their outputs. And so uh, the uh, spirit of the proposal making phase uh, was uh, very much about thinking or considering what is it that each individual or the group needs but that doesn't currently have, what is it that uh, the individual or the group uh, wishes to see more of, uh, what is it that the individual or the group uh, wishes to do but that is never done before, and what are the common goals uh, within the group. And we wanted to keep it really open, as you can see in this screenshot uh, where we have the briefing of uh, the proposal making phase. Uh, um, we wanted to extend it also beyond uh, trust itself. So um, allow uh, people to really think um, any kind of like uh, collaborative ideas or project that they might have in mind. Um, so it was really interesting uh, since the beginning, there was uh, um, a lot of uh, self-coordination uh, and organization. The group immediately created an open document uh, uh, to develop proposals in a collaborative manner. Uh, there was uh, uh, this uh, Excel spreadsheet was created with uh, where people could list uh, their skills, uh, kind of like a skills pool to then match with each other's interests uh, and begin thinking about creating proposals together. Um, there were regular voice meetings uh, happening in the uh, Discord channel to discuss ideas and create new collaborations. So, um, and by the end of the um, proposal phase, uh, um, 16 proposals were submitted. Here you can see some of the images uh, uh, that kind of evoke the, the spirit of the, of the proposals. Uh, and uh, these proposals were ranging from personal art projects, new collaborations, technical experiments and tool development, uh, community initiatives, and also excursions uh, around Berlin. Then um, we wanted to test uh, three voting mechanisms uh, so, um, and see how they felt uh, to the group uh, in the practice. So uh, first we want to test the quadratic voting, which is this uh, multi-vote uh, method. Then we want to test a simple emoji vote, which is a more simple expression of preference. And then ultimately this uh, a random lottery um, uh, mechanism where people could veto a particular proposal if they felt strongly against it. And each of these uh, voting mechanisms uh, was offered a grant of uh, 333 euro um, to fund the winning project. So um, uh, you can see here the voting sheet of the uh, quadratic voting uh, that uh, we borrowed from uh, Radical Market, uh, who has been, uh, which has been um, launching or doing a lot of work to um, uh, uh, spread, uh, like uh, apply quadratic voting to new modes of uh, organizing. And so uh, quadratic voting is quite interesting because it allows people to determine priorities and express intensity of preference um, in a more granular way that the simple um, you know, democratic vote enables. And that's because it, um, um, it allows to express the strength of support to an issue versus another on the basis of increasing the cost of expressing the strong opinion. So we'll see um, how it works in practice uh, in a second, but I want, I'm going to introduce the second voting mechanism which we tried, which was the um, emoji voting. We created a um, specific Discord channel uh, just for these. And so the rules for the emoji voting were that everybody has one vote with the swan emoji. The proposal with five or more votes uh, receives all the funding so that only one proposal can win and it would force uh, um, people to come to consensus on which proposal. And then um, precisely, um, it kind of like, a, yeah, forced uh, participants to um, discuss uh, and, and agree um, outside of the protocol to, um, to achieve a result. And then ultimately the um, lottery veto mechanisms um, 
um, all proposals are entered into a lottery unless they receive a veto and everybody had the right to express a veto with the, uh, to veto one proposals with the no entry sign emoji, but not compulsory. So um, the one proposals that would win the lottery at the end, they would be awarded the full funding. I'll talk um, quickly about the proposals that ended up winning each of these different voting rounds. The winner of the quadratic vote was um, a project by two participants. It was a new collaboration that they put together um, to use speculative biology and storytelling to imagine new forms of life that are both fit to function as negative emission technologies at scale and are integrated in a domestic space. And these three images here um, were submitted with their proposal. This graph shows the results of the quadratic voting round. What's interesting about quadratic voting is it, um, depending on the amount of uh, votes that a person gives to something, uh, that changes the intensity of the preference. So you could submit a few votes um, I should say each person had 100 votes that you could put all onto one project or you could split with five votes on every single project. And if you put all 100 on one project, um, the intensity would be very strong, but um, there wouldn't necessarily be lots of people voting for that thing. So it could still receive a, a lot of votes. Um, and so what this graph is showing is the difference. The orange shows the, um, the actual vote. So this like intensity of the vote and the yellow shows how many votes something received. So you can actually see that the proposal that won the CO2 absorbing biofuel speculative project actually received by quite a large margin, the most votes. Um, and it also received the um, highest intensity of the vote. But you can see, for example, on um, proposal one, MindSeed, it uh, or yeah, it didn't receive so much, so many votes. The yellow line is shorter, but it still received quite a high intensity of the vote. Guys, this is amazing. We want it all, and it's quarter to ten. Just, just saying. Um, okay, I'll go fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was the winner of the emoji consensus voting, uh, which is a collaborative uh, radio play that a group will make in uh, two hours. And the final uh, round, the lottery, um, the winning proposal was about covering the 65 euro administrative fee for the ideas of five homeless people. Um, and what's interesting about these three different projects is they're very um, different in the type of project they are. One is a kind of, although it's a collaboration, it's like a, a smaller individual creative project. The second proposal uh, that one um, is a group project that's very open and anyone can participate in where the final one was a more um, community outreach project. Um, so, I mean, do we want to talk briefly about findings or do we want to move to questions? We definitely want to hear findings because it will help us focus our questions. Thank you. Yeah, I think we kind of mentioned them throughout the presentation, but mostly uh, it was really interesting to test uh, the bias towards community versus individual. And so how the group, uh, the work group was feeling about uh, uh, their own uh, interest perhaps uh, to develop a particular project uh, versus uh, um, you know, the interests of the, of the collective. And so the, we had like really interesting conversation during the first debrief uh, um, about, uh, um, again, the, the relation between private and public conversations uh, within the Discord platform. Um, there were, um, uh, it was interesting that though the voting round lasted a week, everybody waited until the very last few hours uh, to actually submit their votes. And so there was also, I guess, uh, um, maybe this question of transparency because on Discord, uh, uh, obviously the 
the names are one could be pseudonymous, uh, but everybody knows each other. And so uh, there were some, uh, I guess, interesting dynamics uh, there. And then I guess, uh, yeah, at which scale each voting mechanism makes uh, uh, the most sense? Uh, that's a question that we are still working on. For instance, quadratic voting felt a bit over-engineered uh, with such a small group uh, um, where there is already a certain level of trust and where people already want to collaborate. But then it led to really interesting results. So it'd be interesting to, um, you know, exploring more, perhaps a different scale. On the other hand, the MG vote and the lottery veto were, uh, you know, seamlessly integrated into Discord and it was nice to begin seeing like an activation there that made the most sense, particularly with the Swan bot. Uh, Though I think ironically, quadratic voting was the easiest for people to understand how to use um, because there's um, understood ways of interacting with Discord and we kind of, although we were using Discord to do the vote properly, we had to ask for a specific way of using it that didn't necessarily come so naturally. Um, and so that's something that we would also need to test more. Um, it, I didn't mention with the emoji vote, um, nobody discussed publicly. There was a, maybe a misunderstanding that only one proposal could win. Uh, they didn't discuss exactly what they wanted to win. And, but what ended up happening is one working group member um, took it upon themselves to um, investigate attack vectors and uh, tried to bribe different members with quadratic voting votes to vote for his proposal in the emoji voting. Um, and what was also interesting is that apparently people really didn't take it very well. The, the trust working group really is based on a shared sense of trust and they found it uh, very inappropriate for somebody to be trying to bribe them. Oh, uh, this, this is so interesting. It's all the kind of on-chain, on off-chain, yeah. what actually happens in the mechanism and then what leaves the people pulling it outside it. Um, we're going to run over five minutes because really we want to run over by about an hour, I think. Um, would you mind unsharing your screen? Um, I think also there's, we have so many excellent questions that we really are not gonna have time to get to that I think we'll satisfy ourselves with wrapping up with one or two questions from Penny and I based on the kind of uh, general topics that are the common, common topics that are coming up, but I think everyone should know that these questions will go into the processing. And I know that within all of the teams, there there's going to be quite a lot of outputs from this project. Uh, we're all quite geeky, and we want to get into the heart of this. So these questions, you will, I think, we'll see these questions being answered. Um, Penny, do you wanna? Yeah, I mean, I guess like, I would love to know um, in a way like, what does Black Swan do with the relationship between art as a commodity, like a speculative object and art as a producer or inventor of energy built for a new social future? I think we see the that relation that you were articulating, like uh, maybe along the line of the relation between the object and the process. Uh, but in this sense, the artifact, uh, perhaps the output uh, of this, uh, or the um, you know the commodity, would be like a derivative work, as, as you uh, mentioned, like a speculative object that derivates from the process that gives value to um, any kind of outputs within the, uh, within the Black Spawn kind of ecosystem, I think. So um, perhaps uh, it's a, um, I mean, I guess I, I would hope uh, that it's a way to uh, somewhat invert uh, the, the, the ways in which uh, um, the art uh, object and perhaps the process have been um, regarded uh, so um, there is a certain, um, no, 
I guess, uh, understanding or like uh, um, uh, looking at art uh, as, a, as a commodity. What is the commodity is the derivative work of the actual, an actual artistic or creative process that is open and accessible to anyone who would like to participate. And then the outputs uh, can be, um, you know, generating a uh, yeah, derivative, derivative fashion uh, from, uh, from that. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, maybe in a more simple sense, Black Swan is about putting forward a collaborative version of what art can be. Um, and like this initial insight around artists have always worked together is also about breaking down the myth of the individual artist and saying that um, in the face of the precariatization, the neoliberalization of the culture industries, um, groups of creative practitioners can still come together and work together and actually pool their skills and their resources and, um, and make things that are maybe useful to, to other people in similar situations to themselves. So maybe we could end with a follow a question that really follows on from that which I think Pete is bringing up in the questions which is this idea of whether DAOs can be really uh, made bespoke to specific contexts and I guess I'm curious to know your feelings about whether the black swan how much the black swan DAO is shaped by a very particular culture amongst your small crew at trust like how, how would it work? How would it apply elsewhere? And how much is the locality and the tuning to your local culture? How, how much does that affect? How much does the, the functionality, how well will it work applied somewhere else in a, different, in a different setting, do you think? I think this is part of what we have to look at next. If the ambition is for it to be situated in different contexts, both in a single locality or in multiple localities. Um, we had previously been speaking to groups in um, Johannesburg, Vancouver, and Singapore. And I think in the spirit of experimentation, prototyping and testing, that would be a really key question to look at um, and not assume that, for example, the proposal form we made or um, even discord is necessarily something that will work in all of these contexts. Um, yeah, for now, uh, Black Swan has really been uh, incubated or emerged from the uh, context of uh, Berlin and trust. Uh, and so how uh, groups and communities already organize uh, um, here, like uh, we've, uh, we see the needs uh, for cultural workers and creative practitioners. Uh, specific to the context of trust and Berlin, as we were saying, a lot of practitioners falling through the cracks of the um, institutionalized art world uh, because the practices don't fit neatly into any specific uh, category. So in that sense, it's very much informed by the local reality. But then as Calvin was saying, we will really wanna test uh, um, the mechanism so that it could be used in a really trans-local manner. Laura, speaking about the local um, part, what was it for you that like most surprised you in the creation of the DAO, like in that local context? Because I think that's also really interesting. Like we assume that we very much know where our test bed is, but then all sorts of things come up that maybe are alternative or surprising in what you expected. And I'm going to have to demand a short answer because otherwise we're all going to get cut off before we introduce the next session. Okay, so well I guess uh, yeah the most interesting the unexpected thing was the uh, the attack vectors that uh, the group participants were you know pointing to like in a you know playful manner but it was really interesting to have that. Um, yeah. I think one final note before we're cut off is um, we're always looking for new collaborators or people who um, could 
add or contribute something to our research. And so we'd love to hear from anybody um, in the audience who's kind of interested in learning more. And we'll be sure to share our research report um, with Goethe, Further Field and everyone so that um, we can hopefully address some of the questions in more detail. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Laura, Callum, all the collaborators at Trust, to Trust for providing such a nourishing environment for this experimental and diligent work, uh, to the amazing team at the Goethe Institute for all of their work on this. It looks really easy. They make it look really easy, but it's actually quite hard to make these things work so well. Uh, thanks to Ali uh, for her beautiful signing. And please remember to join us next week, same time, uh, I think same place, uh, but we'll let you know, for where we will meet Covalence Studio, uh, Vidisha, Kali, and maybe a couple of other members of the team who've been building an Art World DAO prototype in Johannesburg. Thank you finally to audience. What an amazing set of questions, super helpful. It's really brilliant to be having this conversation in public at last. <laughs>